Let me bring in a special guest for this segment, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, and columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you. All right, and I want to add to that also an equestrian, which is going to help us a lot uh, here. So that's a uh, uh, very interesting stuff. But the thing I wanted to talk about with you is we know when the defense finally gets its opportunity, they're going to sort of have two what I consider to be sort of um, opposing defenses. One is going to be um, uh, insanity, where you're basically claiming that the person had no idea what they were doing. And then you have self-defense, where you almost have to know what you're doing because you're responding to what you consider to be a deadly threat. So I wanted to check in with you to see if there was some way to reconcile those two. How do you suspect this defense might go about doing that? Yes, well, I don't really see a conflict because, <clears throat> you know, first of all, in New Jersey, they go by the McNaughton rule for the insanity defense, which is because of a mental disease or defect, the person did not know what they were doing, or if they did know, they didn't know what was wrong. Um, and if there are apparently he does have a history of some psychiatric problems. Uh, so that would be that would go towards this defense. On the other hand, um, the self to also have the defense of self defense that you don't have to have any kind of you don't have to know um, what you're doing or, or know that it was wrong or because if, if you are feeling threatened, uh, it's an innate response and it's an automatic kind of response to do something uh, to to get back at the person to fire back. You know, it's a li I think what's hard is that um, apparently these disputes have been going on for a long time. And it's a little difficult so far anyway, in court to capture the full nature of it because because you know, it's not just one or two um, little cross examine examination comments, it's a whole long I hope that they're able to get in, you know, the length of it, and that the jury can appreciate the length of this dispute. And what what got me when uh, they asked, you know, why don't you, why didn't you just leave? And she said, well, I have six horses; it's hard to leave. <laughs> really, you know, um, if if things were that bad, uh, and they had a gun, and she was writing all of these posts and so on, obviously she should have left. Yeah, and I, I think you're exactly right. You point out some of the weaknesses uh, in Lauren's testimony. <clears throat> and what's interesting about it is that, you know, she, did, she didn't come across terrible, but certainly some of the things she's saying didn't come across very well. But you're exactly right. What this defense is going to have to do is really show how this sort of built up to really push him over the edge. That's the argument that they're making. The other thing I wanted to check in with you, because you have um, experience in equestrian activities, dressage, which is what this was all about. Take us inside the relationship between the student and teacher in this area. You know, we've seen in other relationships like, let's say, gymnastics, where a lot of discipline is required. Coaches can be difficult. They can be tough. And these things can get uh, a little out of whack sometimes. So take us through what that relationship is like between the student and the teacher. Sure. Well, I've been riding horses since I was a little child. And in the past 20 years, I've been competing um, in eventing, which is dressage and um, stadium jumping and cross country jumping. And so I've had a number of trainers over the years. And certainly I'm not at the level of Olympics as he was. He actually um, was in the 2008 Olympic team for the US and he coached other Olympic uh, athletes and he was the 2009 Sportsman International Horseman of the Year. So he has quite a pedigree. But now in training is, is really um, especially dressage because you have to get that horse <laughs> to make these really exact movements. I mean, it looks flawless, it looks uh, like easy and that's the whole point. The better, best dressage riders make it look like they're not doing anything, but it's really very complicated. And the trainers want you to do well, of course, not just for you and for the horse, but for themselves. It's also an ego thing that, you know, the better you do, of course, that makes them uh, uh, seem like a better horseman as well. But so it's very, you know, it, it's very demanding. And I have had many a lesson where I have been crying by the end of it. But you know, you know, if you have a good relationship with the trainer, you know that they're really trying to help you. It's just that it's very, very, it's a difficult sport. And so it's very demanding. The trainer, a good trainer is demanding. 
Yeah, so it sounds like one can understand where perhaps some misunderstandings and things get out of hand. If a student doesn't quite understand that or get that, things can certainly get out of hand. And, you know, these things uh, end up sometimes uh, like we're seeing here in this case. All right, doctor, thank you so much for being with me. Truly appreciate your time on the show. and.